Welcome everybody. Um, this is our fourth webinar session of the day with the Canal Forest Restoration Projects uh, National Arbor Day Webinar Conference. Um, and our project is part of SUNY Oswego's Rice Creek Field Station. I'm Kristen Haynes. I'm the Assistant Director of the Field Station and also a project member of the Canal Forest Restoration Project. Um, so for this session, uh, it's titled The American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project at ESF. Um, and that's uh, SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry located in Syracuse. Um, so we're really pleased to welcome three members of the team here. So the American Chestnut, um, as many of you know, um, was one of our common forest trees in this region. Um, now you can barely find it. Um, and I'm sure you'll hear more about why from the team members. Um, but researchers with ESF's American Chestnut Project have worked for three decades um, to develop blight resistant trees to restore the species to our forests. Um, now they are seemingly poised for reintroduction of the species. Uh, you'll be hearing from three project members today, Allison Oaks, Linda McWiggin and Andrew Newhouse. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to the Chestnut team. Um, and I will say actually before I turn it over that um, we will have a live Q&A at the end of this session. Um, so if a question comes up as we go along, you can use the live chat feature in YouTube to submit your question. Um, you could also submit it as a comment. Um, so either way, uh, it'll allow me to see them and I'll send your questions on to uh, the team. All right. Okay, I guess I will start us off uh, by sharing my screen here. And let's dive in. So uh, thank you so much for having us. It's really great being here in the uh, metaphorical sense. <laughs> and so uh, the three of us have been working with the American Chestnut Project. I think all of us have been here for over a decade, if not more. And uh, we're here on behalf of uh, Dr. William Powell and Dr. Charles Maynard, who are the uh, co-PIs for the project. And so I will dive us right in with why should we care about the American Chestnut? What is, what is it about this tree? Everybody loves conserving um, all sorts of species and biodiversity is very important, but why this one? Why has this one gotten so much attention? So tell you a little bit about the American chestnut, uh, scientific name Castanea dentata. It is a hardwood species, deciduous, so it loses its leaves in winter. It grows very, very tall quite quickly for a hardwood tree uh, and uh, get just completely huge. Uh, back in the, uh, when Europeans first started coming to North America, these trees, as you can, uh, this picture over here shows, there's a six foot tall lumberjack in between those ginormous tree trunks. They were called almost the Eastern Redwoods or the Redwoods of the East, just the size these trees got, um, absolutely massive. And so here's a couple other examples of just the, the, you don't see trees this big in the woods anymore unless you're deep, deep, deep in. Most of the old uh, growth forests were cut down for building timber, for building ships, um, especially when our Navy was made out of wood. So uh, they're not um, quite as prevalent anymore, but not due to cutting trees down. We'll get to that in a bit. The range was all over the Eastern United States. I mean, as far West uh, as Mississippi, Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee. It didn't really cross the Mississippi River. It stayed to the east of that. But you saw it in the sort of higher elevation ridges of say Georgia and South Carolina, not down in the floodplains. It doesn't like wet soil. And then all through the Appalachians, up in the hills and the, in the crags. And even into Southern Ontario, there's a population uh, that was present there. And even up into Maine, it's pretty cold hardy. Uh, and uh, does pretty well in our, say, Syracuse winters <laughs> covered in snow up here, does, does great. So uh, the leaves, if you're ever walking through the woods and want to try and identify some of these, they're, they're very sort of long, uh, uh, large leaves. They feel almost a little papery, leathery. If they're waxy on top, they're probably not American chestnut. That's more of an Asian chestnut trait. And if they're fuzzy on the bottom, that's also more of an Asian chestnut or a hybrid type trait. Uh, sometimes you see this get, gets confused a lot with horse chestnut that has the palmate leaves, like the five big loopy leaves, but uh, that's uh, not a chestnut 
per se. Um, it's a, it's a Ascalus species, I think. Uh, and this is um, the uh, in the Castanea family. And so this grows very, very tall uh, in the in the forest and needs to break canopy there. And you can see the bark is kind of rugged and uh, cracks a little bit, which will be important later on. But you're probably not going to see a chestnut tree that looks like this. You're going to see one that looks more like a shrub. You'll see these dead stumps with new growth kind of flushing out from the base, and it looks like a big bush. So these you will see all over, uh, let's say, the Appalachian Trail and stuff. You'll see these sort of remnants um, as the chestnut is trying to regrow itself up from the roots. So in the forest, it grows very tall and straight, but if you see it in a big open field, it just spreads out. You get these huge, beautiful spreading trees. So say under the spreading chestnut tree that Philip Smithy stands is likely based off of one of these large, um, wide spreading chestnuts. And so the, the tree has, chestnut tree has both male and female flowers on the same tree, but they don't self, they don't uh, self pollinate. So the male catkins here uh, take about, if you're in full sun, maybe like three, maybe five years to start showing up, then they produce pollen, or the tree is to get high enough in the forest for it to break canopy, and then it will start um, flowering and producing these catkins. They almost look like big fireworks. And then a little later, maybe five to seven years, depending on soil site and sunlight and everything, you'll start to see these little female flowers um, along the sides of the stems. And so here's the little tiny, um, uh, pistols there where we can pollinate and they're actually, we're giving it pollen on a slide here um, to uh, make a particular cross. So we can choose what pollen we wanna use on what mother tree we call them. And then over the course of the summer, this will ripen and you'll get this nice, really spiky, like mega spiky, you need to wear gloves to handle these things burst that will form. And then in the fall, they will start to, the husk will dry out and open and reveal the little chestnut seeds inside usually three to a burr in the case of American chestnut. And this inside is just this nice velvety um, interior, which is in stark contrast to how incredibly spiky and <laughs> the exterior is. <clears throat> so uh, humans have been using chestnuts for centuries, if not millennia, in, all over the world as a great source of, of food. Uh, they're very high in protein, surprisingly, uh, for a nut. And so once you pull off the burr, which you can do either with um, tools or say with your boot is a common way we get the burrs off, you uh, can get this nice um, pile of delicious chestnuts, which commonly in a lot of places are roasted. You sort of score the outside, cook them at a high heat and to cook the nut meats inside. You can also take the nut meats, dry them out and grind them into a lovely flour, which is gluten-free and, and quite tasty uh, for sort of sweet desserts and things. And brewers, of course, will try brewing everything. And in this case, chestnut ale and chestnut beer is really delicious. I think it makes a great addition. If you're into like, say hazelnuts or almonds, those sorts of flavors, um, chestnut is a great flavor to work with. So not just for eating, but the, the wood is fantastic to use as well. Uh, it's a very fine grained wood. And for a hardwood, it's extremely light for how strong it is. And part of this is uh, the strength and durability is due to a compound called tannin, uh, which is why when you see old chestnut barns or chestnut uh, cabins, they've been around for hundreds of years, seemingly without rotting. It's up there with cedar in terms of rot resistance. And not just outdoor stuff, but people used it to make, they said from uh, cradle to grave. So everything from uh, cradles to coffins to furniture, was built with this uh, wood, a very long lasting and durable wood. And not just people, the American chestnut benefited all sorts of native species and the ecology of this uh, region. So turkeys, bears, deer, ducks, everything loves nomming on chestnuts, uh, including uh, passenger pigeons. They believe the passenger pigeons, uh, one of its big dietary components was American chestnut. And so one of the reasons it went extinct early on the century is the loss of this food source. Why am I posting a fish? Fish don't eat trees. Well, fish eat stream invertebrates and stream invertebrates feed on leaf litter. And some initial studies have found that stream invertebrates grow faster and healthier when they eat American chestnut leaf litter, which makes sense if American chestnut is the most dominant tree for millions of years in, the, in these regions. And finally, also native pollinators. There is a, uh, a chestnut bee that has almost vanished from the landscape, but is still found in like um, 
related trees, say in the Ozark Mountains and stuff, they think there may have been a lot of insects that were severely affected by the loss of the American chestnut. So where'd it go and why? And so the chestnut blight is a disease caused by the fungus Cryphonetria parasiticum. And what it looks like on a chestnut is a horrible swelling canker. So the fungus gets in via a little crack in the bark somewhere, and then it starts uh, secreting a nasty organic acid called oxalic acid, which slowly kills the tree around the area around the infection site. And then the fungus grows and it secretes acid and then it grows and secretes acid and it just spreads unchecked all around the uh, tree. And so what this does, it kills the all the tree above the infection site, it effectively girdles the stem. And then the tree just dies back and it'll get infection lower and an infection lower and it'll just die back all the way to the ground. Now, the fungus can't get into the root system. So the tree isn't completely dead, but it is severely, anything above ground growth is severely hit. So this arrived in New York City around probably a little before the turn of the century. So, so this is, they think it was maybe introduced like 1896 and it was formally found in like 1904. And then over time, sort of waves of infection moved from centering out from New York City across the range of the chestnut tree. And so they just, there's no natural resistance in the American chestnut population, uh, as opposed to say the Asian chestnut species that have co-evolved with this fungus. And so it just wiped them out pretty much, killed them all down to the roots. Uh, and it affects other species too, like Allegheny chinkapin and Ozark chinkapin and it survives on oak trees. So even if there aren't any chestnuts around, you'd think there wasn't any fungus around, but lo and behold, it just hangs out on oak trees. So you go to plant a chestnut orchard where you've never seen a chestnut before and you can still get this chestnut blight showing up. So here's a picture of a mountain uh, that is um, covered in chestnuts flowering in July. They'd say it would look like snow in July, just all these flowers and um, fluffy white tops of the trees. <laughs> and so for, think of, you know, this going to something that looks more like this, you know, almost in some places, you know, a quarter percent of your forest canopy just disappearing, equivalent to some places sort of like we're having with ash and emerald ash borer right now, just people coming down and having to take out all these dead trees in an area. And this was a catastrophe at the time because of all the food the chestnuts provided, people would fatten hogs on it. It was used, the tans were used for the leather industry. And so there's a lot of evidence showing that the a collapse of the Appalachian economy was really tied into the loss of this tree. So they're not completely gone because those root systems are still there and the trees will try and re-sprout, but there's only so much they can do. Even though these sprouts can grow huge, like almost seven feet in one season, eventually it's gonna get big enough, get the blight and die back. And there's only so long that these trees can keep doing this. They can't, they can't get big enough to reproduce they're not putting out seeds, and so there's not a whole lot of um, good luck for these guys. So what are the options? How can we possibly save this chestnut and bring it back into the, it's only been gone 100 years, you know, the nature remembers, and there's lots of things that depend on this tree. Well, we could just wait because evolution will find a way, but the problem there being is that evolution requires reproduction, and chestnut trees are dying before they get old enough to reproduce. So if we wait, we're just waiting for them all to eventually die. <clears throat> what about artificial selection? Can we find a resistant American chestnut tree and then breed it back into the population? Well, so far we haven't been able to find any resistant American chestnut trees. So artificial selection isn't gonna work. The next option would be to hybridize American chestnut with the um, Asian Caspinia species that do have resistance to blight. And they do hybridize. You can cross these trees together. The problem with that being is that there are 40,000 genes in the chestnut genome, and there's likely more than 20 involved in blight resistance. And so originally they thought there were maybe just three, and three is reasonable. Three is easy to cross over and get into your uh, genome there, but 20 makes it a much more difficult and time-consuming proposition, especially given, given how long you have to wait for the trees to grow and reproduce. So there has been some very interesting work done there. Uh, but what about if we added a new blight resistance trait to the American chestnut, just de novo? And so that could work if we could find a piece of DNA that would code for an enzyme that could help the tree defend itself against the fungus. And so you'd have to find the right gene. And this is where kind of Dr. Powell was looking at back way back when, that uh, some strains of chestnut blight grow much faster than others. Let's see if the sound comes through. We have two different types of chestnut blight. 
there. I don't know if I shared my sound or not. Okay. Dramatic music. Look at this one go. It's just, this one is waiting and then sort of popping out, you know? This one is just going like a train right here. So, so the difference between these, oh, go back, go back picture. Oh, well. So the one that was spreading very fast found that it, it is excreting. It is just sending out to the tissue lots of oxalic acid. It's just pumping out acid and the, the plant cells don't have any offense against it. Whereas the one that was going slower isn't making that much oxalic acid and the, it's, it's just not progressing at a fast enough rate. So they found this conclusion that this, the amount of oxalic acid the fungus is producing is how virulent or how nasty uh, the various strains of chestnut blight are. Which leads us to the question, okay, so what is oxalic acid? It's this, I know that clears it up a lot. It's, it's an organic acid um, and a lot of fungal pathogens use this as a, as a weapon, especially necrotrophic ones that kill plant tissue so they can then eat it up. And so the crystals of acid weaken cell walls there. Uh, like the sclerotinia is a really nasty pathogen that infects over 400 plant species and it uses this acid to, to attack them. Wood rotting fungi use it as well to rot wood. And humans, uh, oxalic acid can literally form kidney stones and can be directly toxic. There's stories of people in Victorian era committing suicide by drinking oxalic acid. So it's not, it's not a great uh, thing that this fungus is producing. So the idea being, what if we've got this acid that we wanna get rid of, and if only we had an enzyme, an enzyme is like a little molecular machine or pair of scissors in this case that has one job, one function. If we had just an enzyme that could somehow take care of that oxalic acid, we'd be good to go. But with um, genetic engineering, the idea is if you have a DNA instruction, like one strip of DNA that codes for one gene, and that gene can tell the plant cell how to make this enzyme, then it will produce an enzyme and the enzyme will snip that oxalic acid and problem solved. So, but the idea for uh, this is to have just one simple solution that's not gonna cause a lot of issues. And lo and behold, there is an enzyme that does just that. It's called oxalate oxidase. And we call it oxo a lot in short because we say it an awful lot of times. So this is an enzyme that breaks down oxalic acid. And the cool thing about this is it's present in all of our food, basically. It's in uh, wheat, barley, rye, corn, and rice. And it's a very common plant defense mechanism against these types of fungi. So it takes the oxalic acid and cleaves it in hydrogen peroxide, which is a plant uh, defense um, hormone and then carbon dioxide, which the plant can easily use. So it's not a pesticide. It doesn't actually kill the fungus. It's just breaking down that nasty acid the fungus is using. And so this, since it's not a direct pesticide, it's very unlikely that the fungus is gonna overcome or make resistance to this particular pathway. And we're just gonna change the fungus's lifestyle from being a direct pathogen to being more of a, I guess I make a little canker and I live on you, but I don't kill you, uh, saprophyte. So a lot of different plants have this enzyme. So like I said, the wheat, corn, barley, rice, uh, all the monocots, but then we also find it in dicots like peanut and strawberry. We found it in walnuts, in walnut trees, tomato, caco, sorghum, potato, apricot, pea dates, beets. These are the ones we could find papers on. Uh, we've also seen it present in a lot of native New York and um, Eastern US grasses. A lot of, uh, like I said, the monocots, the grasses have this enzyme occurring naturally. And so there's probably a whole lot more, but these are the ones we found so far. So the idea of the timeline here, this whole project was back in 1990, the New York chapter of the TACF reached out to Dr. Powell and Dr. Maynard and said, hey, we've heard about this genetic engineering thing. Do you think you could help the American chestnut some way? And so they've been working on this since, since 1990 at the bequest of the New York state uh, chapter here. And then in 2006, so it took a while to develop the first transgenic uh, chestnut. And then it took another six years to show they developed resistance. And then another couple of years to show that the resistance would be heritable and passed down to their offspring. And finally, 2020, this is when we're entering federal regulatory pathways. So this has been 30 years of working with the public and lots of um, really exciting uh, groups to, to sort of see this idea come to play. So the next question is, now that they, since we decided what this gene was gonna be, how exactly did we add it to the American chestnut genome? And to answer that question, I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to hand it over to Linda. Hi, sorry about that. Um, 
I am Linda McGuigan, um, and I'm going to discuss how we do the transformations. Um, and um, is, is that, is the screen just the, it's not in, uh, okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the transformation process of American chestnut and mm -hmm. Linda, just to, uh, if you start your slideshow. Um, oh, that's what I'm not doing. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> sure. There we go. That's better. Um, so I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the bacteria that we use to do the transformation. And this is called agrobacterium. And it's a natural plant genetic engineer. Um, this uh, bacterium has transformed sweet potato about 8,000 years ago. Um, it transferred a few genes into the sweet potato. Uh, scientists believe that these genes have made it edible um, for human consumption. Um, so what happens is the agrobacterium has a circular piece of DNA in it called a plasmid. And that plasmid will transfer over um, some of its DNA into the plant cell. And when it gets in the plant cell, it has the plant produce food for the agrobacterium. It creates this gall with this food in it. And um, scientists have been able to take that gene out that creates this gall and put in the gene of interest. Um, so in our case, we're putting in the oxalate oxidase gene, which uh, conveys blight tolerance. And the agrobacterium will attach to the plant cell and transfer this one gene over. Um, and then we will get a blight tolerant American chestnut. The tissue that we use to transform are embryos. And what we need to do is get the embryos out of the nut. So about a month after pollination, uh, we will cut these burrs off of the tree. And Allison showed a picture of what the burrs look like. We will cut them off the tree and open them up and take out the nuts. We'll sterilize the nuts in a 50% bleach solution for about five minutes. And we do this in a laminar flow hood, which is a hood that blows sterile air towards you. We'll open up the nut, we'll cut the nut open to expose the embryos. And usually there's anywhere from uh, nine to 15 embryos in there. Mo on average, it's about 12. And we'll take those embryos and we'll put them on a nutrient medium. And the nutrient medium contains salts and sugars and hormones that the plants need to grow. And many of the uh, embryos will die. Some of them will get a contaminant on them like a fungus or a bacteria, but some of them will start growing new embryos. And these we can multiply. And this is a clump of embryos and they all have the same DNA, they're clonal. And what we'll do is we'll mix these embryos with the agrobacterium in a test tube, put them on this machine and we will mix them together for an hour. Once they've been mixed thoroughly, uh, we will transfer it to what's called a desiccation plate, which is just a piece of filter paper that's slightly moistened. And this is where that process of the transfer of the DNA happens. After that, they go into a bioreactor, which is a chamber that has, or it's a container that has two chambers. And the top chamber, has the embryos in it, the embryo clumps, and the bottom chamber has the medium, it has a liquid medium that will, um, that contains the nutrients plus an antibiotic that will kill off any of the, um, any of the um, non-transformed cells or the agrobacterium. And we turn it on every six hours and it floods for a duration of two minutes, and then the medium will um, the medium will surround the embryos. This occurs for uh, six to eight weeks, 
and then it will go back, the embryos will go back onto semi-solid medium, which has the nutrients in it. And um, we will uh, test them to see if the gene of interest was incorporated into the genome. Uh, I want to talk about events, which um, if you see here, um, this represents three cells in the American chestnut genome. Uh, chestnut have 12 chromosome, chromosome pairs, excuse me, humans have 23 pairs. And in the first cell, if the gene of interest, in this case, the oxalate oxidase gene gets um, incorporated into the seventh chromosome, we call that event one. If in the second cell it gets incorporated into the fourth one, we would call that event two. And sometimes two of the genes get put in two different chromosomes. In this case, it would be one and eight, and that would be called event three. We keep these events separate and we will grow them up. And it is important because depending on where it goes in the, um, in the genome will affect how it is expressed. Once we know that it has the gene of interest in it, we will grow these events up and germinate them into shoots. The shoots will get grown bigger and we will cut off the bottom of them, dip them into a rooting gel and then grow roots on them. These will get potted up and covered with a baggie so that they don't desiccate or dry out. Um, they go into a growth chamber. You can see on the top shelf, those are the small ones, the newly uh, rooted ones. They have the baggies on them. The growth chamber has high humidity, but it's not enough for those uh, newly formed uh, shoots uh, with roots. So um, that's why we keep the baggies on. Uh, once they get big enough, we can take the baggies off and then put the plantlets into a greenhouse until we are ready to plant them out either in the summer, uh, the spring or the fall. Um, how do we test for blight resistance? Um, one of the tests we do is called a leaf assay and we will grow up the fungus on a Petri dish and we will take a leaf from the plant and make a small incision in the uh, mid vein and we'll take the fungus and put it on that, that cut on the mid vein and we will let it sit for three to seven days and then we can measure how big the necrosis is and the necrosis is dead cells. And we can compare American chestnut wild type to the transgenic chestnut or to Chinese chestnut. And this test is Preliminary, it, can, it will correlate to what we see in the field later on when we do our tests. Uh, we also do tests in the greenhouse with um, small stems. So we'll grow up the, the plants and make an incision on the stems and put the fungus on that uh, incision. And you can see here, the left is wild type American chestnut. The center is the transgenic uh, chestnut and the right is the Chinese chestnut. And all of the wild type chestnut have, American chestnut have died. Um, the transgenic and the uh, Chinese chestnut are doing okay. Some of the Chinese chestnut, however, have died back. Uh, this is a close up of some of their stems. The wild type have these sunken cankers that, um, that are killing it, whereas the transgenic and the Chinese are growing tissue to protect the, the tree from the fungus. We, can, we also do tests in the field. So these are a little bit older and you can see that the Chinese or the, excuse me, American chestnut on the left, which is wild type is completely blighted and dying where as the transgenic is able to uh, keep the fungus at bay. Uh, we finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some uh, interaction, interaction tests we've done um, just to make sure that not, the tree is not harmful to other species. We've, uh, we've checked out uh, mycorrhizae, which are soil fungus. We've uh, done tests on the soil community and native seeds. Uh, we've tested on 
uh, tadpoles to make sure that leaf litter in vernal pools would not be harmful to them. And we've done tests on insects and on bumblebees. And all of our tests have shown that this uh, gene has, is not harmful to other species. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and go to Andy. All right, thank you very much. My name is Andy Newhouse, and I am going to do best, my best to move quickly through the regulatory process. And that's probably the least exciting part for most people anyway, but um, I'll try and sum up at least kind of where we are and what we're, uh, what we're working on. So before I kind of get started with the details, I want to mention that there are several options for what we could potentially do to deal with the problem of chestnut blight. And we've described some of these. There are a few more that we don't really have time to go into detail. But um, one of the options is that we don't have to do anything. But as Allison described, we kind of know what the outcome would be if we go that route. And the chestnuts will continue to decline and uh, ultimately American chestnuts would disappear from the environment. Um, but if, including looking at some of these other options, my question is which ones of these involve risks? And the answer of course is that all of them potentially involve risks. And so there aren't any options that are risk-free. But I'll also note that the only one that's regulated by the government is genetic engineering. And so I'm gonna go into that a little bit here, but um, one of, I want to emphasize that we aren't looking for a risk-free option since one doesn't exist, but instead we're looking at relative risks between genetic engineering and traditional methods. So currently everything we have planted outside or even everything that we move from place to place, every, every piece of transgenic material um, is covered by permits from the USDA. So currently everything is confined and, and, and covered by these permits. Before we would be allowed to distribute transgenic trees or use them for large scale restoration plantings, we would need to get approval from three different federal agencies in the US. And since the uh, range of the American chestnut extended into Canada, we would be um, talking to Canadian regulators also. Um, and I'll go ahead and start right off. Everyone asks how long this is going to take. And there are lots of unknowns, but our best guess is maybe two to five years before we can start distributing transgenic trees. So the first agency I'll talk about in more detail is the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and they generally regulate pesticides. And so my question, first question is, what's a pesticide? And I think most people kind of initially assume, oh, it's something that kills a pest. And that's kind of the dictionary definition. Uh, maybe repelling a pest would also fit into that definition. And so we uh, kind of thought, we, we actually questioned whether we would even be regulated by the EPA because the oxalate oxidase enzyme doesn't kill the pest. It doesn't repel the pest. It doesn't prevent infections. As you can see in this, uh, this picture here and some of the others that have been shown earlier, transgenic chestnut trees can still get chestnut blight, but our goal was to allow them to survive, allow them to tolerate that infection and thrive much like Chinese chestnuts do in their native range. So um, the EPA has decided, has defined um, a pesticide, however, as something that can mitigate a pest, and so we are regulated by the EPA. Um, moving on just for the sake of time to the next agency is the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and they regulate safety of food and feed. Um, so to address some of their questions, we've done several different nutrition analyses on the uh, chestnuts. Um, they're also interested in uh, allergens and toxins and whether this change could result in any, um, any new uh, concerns there. They're also concerned with food labeling. So for example, this package of chestnuts, it says low fat and the FDA regulates things like whether you can put low fat on a package and, uh, and so on. Um, they don't regulate every detail. You'll notice here based on Allison's description that the picture in this package is actually a horse chestnut. Um, and unrelated, you don't wanna eat horse chestnuts, but uh, <laughs> not everyone catches that. 
it's a common mistake. Anyway, um, much of our argument to the FDA is that oxalate oxidase is present in so many foods. Um, one of the specific tests that we've done is about tannin content and tannins are proteins or uh, commonly pigment compounds that uh, often have a bitter flavor, like acorns have a lot of tannins, which is why we don't really like to eat them, but they're important for wildlife and livestock food, and they can actually have some antimicrobial properties that are helpful. So the FDA asked us about testing tannins in transgenic chestnuts. And um, so we tested several different kinds of chestnuts. On the far left in the green bar is uh, the tannin concentration in our transgenic chestnuts. And in the bar adjacent to that is a related control that doesn't have the transgene. And you can see that the, the presence of the transgene doesn't change the tannin concentration. The next three bars are other unrelated American chestnuts, maybe grown in different places and different environments, different years. And you can see that the tannin concentration varies widely in these other unrelated chestnuts. Um, so there's definitely some differences, maybe due to, to environmental conditions or soil uh, properties, but the presence of the transgene is not driving a difference. We've seen similar things for other types of nutrition analyses also. Um, moving on to the third agency is the USDA, and uh, they regulate what they call plant pest risks, or sort of general environmental uh, safety. And we have actually submitted a petition. The USDA has accepted this petition, and so that will be public very soon. And the first part of that process, skip down to the bottom here, is that they are uh, holding an open comment period. They're actually soliciting feedback from the public. They want to see if there are any questions questions that might not be answered in our petition. Um, and we would also be really interested in, uh, in hearing from people who are excited about chestnuts. This would be a great opportunity for people to, um, to share feedback with the USDA. And if you follow either ESF Chestnut Project or Chestnut Foundation, you will hear soon when that open comment period starts. But as far as our petition to the USDA, we are looking at several different aspects of the tree and um, whether the American chestnut as a species or whether the oxalate oxidase gene or whether some interaction there could potentially represent a novel plant pest risk. And um, we have not seen any evidence that that might be the case. Um, Linda has already talked about some of the environmental interactions very briefly. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into those in much detail. But again, we've looked at several different things in the lab and in greenhouse and in field plots and not seen any suggestion that the presence of the transgene would um, interrupt or, or be detrimental to any of these environmental relationships that we've looked at so far. Of course, it would be interesting and, and helpful to look at these on a larger scale and in more uh, natural habitats since we've actually started this. Uh, under permitted plots, we have three different sites planted across the range of the chestnut. Uh, they were started last year and so we're looking at different things like different restoration methods and open field plantings versus plantings in wooded areas. Um, again, we're starting to look at some of these inter environmental interactions. And then there are a few types of questions like how far can the, fo can the pollen effectively travel and how uh, do chestnuts get dispersed naturally um, that we can't really answer under our permits or with uh, kind of confined trials. So those questions will rely on or we'll have to wait until we um, get approval from the federal agencies, but it's important that we have these plots in place. The trees are already growing. So the very first kind of restoration scale plantings we're doing will allow us to collect data and re really inform um, any potential future restoration plantings. Um, speaking of those potential restoration plantings, uh, Linda described propagating American chestnut trees and so the, or propagating transgenic chestnut trees rather by tissue culture. And that's a great way to make more of these trees and um, it's great for small scale experiments because they're consistent. But when we propagate these in the lab, they're all identical. There's no genetic diversity. And that's pretty much exactly what we don't want for a restoration project. We're looking for lots of diversity. We want the trees to be adaptable to different environmental conditions, to different parts of the range. And so our colleagues at the American Chestnut Foundation have done a lot of careful modeling and predicting 
how much diversity would be needed for a restoration project to have this kind of robust resilience and diversity in a restoration population. And so this would involve taking pollen from our first transgenic chestnut trees and outcrossing to wild relatives. And we've done this kind of on a small scale in permitted plots. We've started it, I guess, in permitted plots. But um, we would hope to, if we get regulatory approval, continue this out to more and more trees, maybe up to about 500 after the third or fourth generation. Um, and these would be trees from different parts of the chestnut range with maybe unique adaptations to different environments. We'd really like to uh, incorporate a lot of that diversity for, for um, appropriate restoration plantings. This will take a while uh, to do this many generations of breeding. Um, this whole project is described in the paper here, but um, Sooner than that, we would hope to do what we would call a horticultural distribution. So if we get regulatory approval, we would be able to distribute a smaller number of trees to a small number of people, maybe supporters, chestnut enthusiasts, educational plantings, demonstration, more research plots. Um, and I'd also mention that in both of these cases, uh, we the trees are not planted. <laughs> patented, the tree, there are no patents, um, and they wouldn't be sold for profit. Our goal is for, uh, for restoration. Um, I don't have a lot of time to go into the details, but there have been a few social scientists who have done research uh, independent of, of our group, but looking at public perception and kind of public acceptance of uh, genetic engineering. And in the case of agricultural biotechnology, kind of the GM foods that are often um, talked about, uh, there's there's some monoskepticism that people are, are kind of concerned about a few different things like uh, corporate control of agriculture and pesticide use and various related concerns. Um, but when these social scientists have done surveys about, uh, you know, looking at opinions about the use of genetic engineering for restoration or for treating things like uh, addressing things like endangered species or invasive species, um, they've found that a majority of the public would accept genetic engineering in the face of a concrete threat like chestnut blight or like other like addressing other invasive species and this really matches what we've seen in our own presentations is the that a lot of people are excited about chestnut restoration by whatever method would be uh, safe and um, effective so we have lots of people who are excited about chestnut trees and uh, very briefly as i'm wrapping up here there's also potential if uh, things kind of go well if uh, this is one of the tools that can be effectively used, that there are a number of other trees facing threats. You're probably familiar with uh, disease threats to ash and elm, um, but there are even other types of environmental threats, uh, seabirds being threatened by invasive rodents on islands, uh, the black-footed ferret is endangered, uh, coral reefs are facing threats from things like acidification and ocean warming, and uh, genetic engineering or biotechnology more generally wouldn't necessarily be the best tool for every case, but it could be a potential tool to deal with some of these really serious threats. Um, so we're excited about that potential. I'll wrap up by saying that uh, this work requires patience, uh, both working with trees and working with the federal regulatory agencies can be pretty slow moving processes. So I'm hoping that my kids here will be able to uh, enjoy restored chestnut forests. With that, if you are excited about American chestnut trees and if you'd like to kind of participate in restoration, then my suggestion would be to join the American Chestnut Foundation, uh, specifically the New York chapter. And we would love to uh, see your support and have you follow along. Thank you very much. You're muted, Kristen. <laughs> Thanks for that. I guess I was muted. Um, I was just saying thank you so much for that. We do have time for a few questions. Um, so I'll start off with one question I have, and then I'll move to, to some that came in online. Um, so in terms of looking ahead to other projects beyond this one with possibly other species, do you think CRISPR gene editing will really 
make it like a little bit more of a faster process or do you see that as being an application that could be used on um, future species? It absolutely could be used. It depends a lot on the species and on the pest. It could potentially be faster, but there could be a lot of kind of developmental hurdles or developing the, the techniques that wouldn't necessarily be a quick and easy fix. So that's another tool. Absolutely, it would be important. It would um, potentially raise other uh, regulatory questions, but absolutely could be valuable for some applications. Okay. Um... So we have a question here. Um, you described how you're you're really not targeting, um, you know, removing the fungus that that the pathogen's still there. It's just not, you know, affecting the trees. Um, it's not killing the trees. But someone asked, is there no way to kill the fungus? Um, like, I guess why wasn't that uh, the aim or, you know, whatever. So um, one of the things about that is that there, there is uh, a virus that infects the fungus that makes it less uh, pathogenic. It's called hypovirulence, it's something I didn't think I had time to get into. It actually worked really well in Europe when the chestnut blight went to Europe. They were able to sort of use these uh, fungal strains that had been sort of um, uh, reduced pathogenicity of the virus and um, spread that onto their trees and they could keep their chestnut orchards alive and thriving. The trees don't look super great. They're covered in cankers, but they're alive. So one of the things that happened when the chestnut blight came to the United States is with this huge pool of trees to infect, it diversified really quickly. The fungus actually evolved into so many different strains and so many different types that hypovirulence hasn't been a really effective mean to control it. The other reason being you have to uh, someone, some human like needs to go and apply the hypovirulent virus to cankers and chestnuts get really, really big. And I remember, didn't Dr. Powell at some point have a grad student filling BB pellets with like fungus cultures and trying to shoot them up into trees with a BB gun? Like there's no way that we can go out and like, you know, paste fungus onto canopy sized trees. So while it did work in Europe because they were using more orchard trees and sort of caring for specific plantings, for a wild tree restoration project, it's just not, it's not feasible. And the, the, fung the hypovirulence isn't transmitting naturally between all those different strains of Hyphenectria. So. I would also yeah. add that even if there were a good way to kill the fungus, and people have tried kind of fungicides, it's basically, it's hard to apply them or use them effectively on chestnut trees. But even if there were a good fungicidal uh, product that could kill the chestnut blight fungus, that might not be the most stable or reliable way to deal with it because that would be creating what we would call a selective pressure. They'd be killing most of the fungus. And if the fungus could like evolve a way to avoid dying, <laughs> then those kind of evolved strains would replicate and have a great advantage and then that uh, that treatment wouldn't really be effective. That has been observed in agricultural systems with other types of pests for sure. So we are optimistic that this uh, mechanism of not killing the fungus, of allowing the tree to defend itself, should be a more stable mechanism. And that is why you should always finish your antibiotics. When you're prescribed a 14 day run, you need to take the whole 14 day run to knock everything out. Because if you quit at day six and a couple survived, now they're getting resistant to the antibiotic. It's the same sort of idea. Same process. Yeah, interesting connection there for sure. Um, <clears throat> so someone asked, and I think this probably applies to other animals. Someone asked, how do deer avoid the spiky exterior? So if you're removing them with your boots, how would an animal eating the chestnuts get around that spiky exterior? Well, when, when they are fully ripe, the exterior will dry out and sort of crack and open. So uh, we gather them before they open so that the animals don't have a chance to get there. Occasionally they have opened, but we put these um, mesh bags over every possibly transgenic branch so that the animals can't get to them right now. But no, the, the holes will eventually like pop and release the seeds and then the animals get to them. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so I think we'll just go with this uh, one last question. Um, so someone asks, are you going to do a Kickstarter for your trees? 
And I, maybe just more generally, how could people who are interested, um, I mean, you mentioned that they could join the foundation, but is there like a concrete way that people could help the project? I think that the American Chestnut Foundation would be um, definitely a good starting place. Andy, you want to say something else? Sure, the link to our project page on ESF's website does have, I believe there's a place to donate still there. We have done something like a Kickstarter, a crowdfunding campaign, and I believe that's still available, but definitely joining the Chestnut Foundation would be the best way to uh, keep up with us and to uh, support us if you're interested. Thanks. Also, uh, Chestnut Foundation members are probably much higher in the uh, order if you want to actually get a tree being part of the chestnut foundation puts you that much closer in in the uh queue for receiving trees or pollen or such fantastic well um i want to thank the members of the american chestnut uh research and restoration project at esf this has been a really uh interesting discussion of a number of different issues involved with american chestnut and your restoration project. So we want to thank you very much. Um, is there anything that you would like to add or leave folks with? Uh, helping support our forests is just an absolutely great thing to do. And I know it's been an honor working for this project and just having such a really cool goal is a really great part of being a scientist and working towards this sort of thing. So um, go into STEM. STEM majors for the win. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is a wonderful example of a local project that um, can have a really big impact. So on Arbor Day, please consider, you know, what you can do to help out, whether it's a chestnut tree or, or a different tree project. Um, so uh, we want to wish everybody a very happy Arbor Day and please come uh, join us if you're interested for our following sessions today, which will discuss um, the kind of forest restoration project that we're doing at SUNY Oswego um, and then just some other fun webinars to join. So thank you all again.